Hi folks and welcome back to the channel. Today I thought we'd talk about some unrealistic expectations that people have when they first get started in amateur astronomy. We have a lot of new people here both in the hobby and to the channel and I'm finding some of these same issues are cropping up over and over again so I thought we'd try to address some of these. So here we go. Okay, so first up we have an old chestnut. Please do not buy a $100 telescope. We used to refer to these as department store telescopes, but with the demise of physical brick and mortar stores, we are now calling them department store grade telescopes. Sadly, well over 90% of everything that's sold as a telescope does fall into this category. I have been saying this for 25, 30, 40 years, as have most responsible outlets on astronomy, but people just seem to keep buying these things. They bring them to astronomy clubs, and we just don't know what to say. You're actually better off not buying a telescope at all than buying a $100 telescope. You're actually better off just looking up at the night sky with a planisphere or a set of star charts or an app on your phone. You're going to learn a lot more, and you're going to have a lot more fun. So I have several buyer's guides here on this channel. You can check those out. You can also check out the buyer's guides on most other good astronomy channels. You'll see the same half dozen or so models recommended over and over again. Also, I'll point out right now, we've got a bit of inflation going on. The $100 junk telescope has now turned into the $200 junk telescope. So please don't fall into this one. Do the right thing. Okay, so here's a personal pet peeve of mine. If you haven't figured it out yet, please do not believe any of the weight carrying capacities listed by any mount manufacturer. They all exaggerate. I think this sort of weight claim creep started, I noticed about 20 years ago, and then you know this manufacturer claimed this and everybody else retaliated, and we have this absurd situation right now where we have some really wild claims for what these mounts will carry. So if you want a general guideline as to what I think mounts will hold, I have three general tests that I run in my head to figure out what I think it's going to carry if it's a mount that I've never seen before. So first of all, take the manufacturer's weight claim and cut it in half. This isn't a perfect rule of thumb, but it kind of gets you into the ballpark. The second thing is that a mount will carry about half its weight. So a 35 pound mount will carry, you know, somewhere in that 15 to 17 pound range. The third thing to look out for is the size of the counterweight that they give you in an equatorial mount. This gives you a better idea of what the manufacturer really thinks that mount will hold. So I'm going to go ahead and pick on my Celestron AVX mounts. I have three of these things. They weigh about 35 pounds, and depending on which website you go to, they claim that they'll hold anywhere between 30, 32, 35 pounds in that range, which is way too much. So, you know, cut the weight in half, and you're looking at about, you know, 15 to 17 pounds. Second check is that the mount will carry about half its weight. You know, again, in that you're in that 15, 16, 17 pound range, depending on which counterweight that you have on it. Third check is that they give you a 13 pound counterweight in the package. That's probably closer to what the, I think that mount will probably hold. So the three numbers are sort of in that realm, you know, 13, 15, 16 pounds, a little bit closer to what I think that mount's going to hold. Again, these rules of thumb are just that. They get you into the ballpark. There's going to be some adjustments either way, depending on the mount that you're actually looking at. And about those AVXs, I recently had to use one of those to hold a Celestron C9 and a quarter when one of my other mounts died. And C9 and a quarter weighs 19 to 20 pounds. It was a real struggle. I mean, visually it was okay maybe, but once I tried to do any imaging with it, it wasn't anywhere near steady enough. I took several frames of several deep sky objects and I had to throw out close to half of them because they were just jiggling and moving in, not sharp at all. Okay, so the third thing I've been seeing a lot lately is people having unrealistic expectations of their electronic go-to mounts. You know, you read the brochures and you go into websites and they sound amazing, don't they? You dial the object you want on the keypad, the motors move the scope itself, and the telescope finds the object all by itself. Well, if you've been around in the hobby for a while, you know that doesn't always happen. 
These things are small computers. They are mated to motors and encoders. And so there's electronic devices. There are mechanical devices. They have to work together. And computers, they can glitch. They can crash. They can fail. They can do all sorts of weird things. And they can even stop working altogether. So people who have been in the hobby for a while, you know that these things can happen, but beginners are very often surprised to hear that these things occur. Now, most of the time, the problems you're going to have are relatively minor, and the most common complaint we have is that the electronic telescope does not find what it is that you've dialed up on the keypad. So many beginners assume that when you call something up, the object is going to be right in the center of the field of view, and the first thing you're going to find is that doesn't happen. A lot of times the object will be off to the side, or it may be slightly outside the field of view, and you've got to kind of pan around with the keypad to get it back. All of this, of course, depends on the focal length of your telescope and the magnification that you're using. I have mounts that, for example, have dead spots in the sky. I have a Nexstar, for example, that just does not like the southeastern part of the sky. I don't even try to use it there. Second most serious thing that happens is that something glitches and it appears to stop working altogether or it will think that north is south or it doesn't know the date and you can't convince it otherwise or it thinks the winter is the summer and this sort of thing. Most of the time you can either reflash the memory or do a factory reset on the controller and things will go back to normal and then things will work for a while and then you've got to do it again you know, a few months or a year or so later. I have three Celestron AVX mounts, and people ask me, why do you have three of those things? And my response is, well, you, you kind of have to have three of those things because at any given moment in time, one or two of them is doing something a little funky. I have one of them, for example, that is convinced it's the year 2000, and it cannot be convinced otherwise. So it kind of works, but it kind of doesn't work. The most serious thing that happens is that the mount just dies altogether. This just happened to me a few days ago. I have a Celestron CGE mount. That's a fairly large and expensive piece of equipment. It just died on me. Uh, I don't know if it can be fixed. If it can't be fixed, I have a 100 pound paperweight sitting in the garage. So again, if you've been in the hobby for a while, you know that these things could happen. You're nodding in agreement. You've seen these things go on. But again, for beginners, you may be surprised that these things go on at all. So you might want to just tamper your expectations that way. Okay, so the next unrealistic expectation is astrophotography. I have a steady stream of people contacting me coming from outside the hobby saying they want to get involved in astronomical imaging and they have no idea what they're getting themselves into. On the surface, it seems like a relatively simple thing to do to stick a camera on your telescope and just start shooting. Those of you who have actually tried this know this is one of the hardest things you will ever do. Astrophotography is actually a pretty broad term encompassing at least three separate disciplines. There's nightscapes, that is anything where you're sticking a camera on a tracking mount and taking wide field shots of the sky, usually with a camera lens of some kind. There is webcam lunar planetary, that is anything that is big and round in the sky, that's the moon, the planets, and sometimes even the sun, usually involving an astronomical specific webcam. And then there is guided deep sky, which usually involves you guiding a telescope for a very long time on a distant object outside of our solar system. That's where you get all of those beautiful colors and nebulas and sort of, that sort of thing. Each one of those disciplines requires its own equipment and its own skill set, and each one of them takes a lifetime to master. Okay, so I thought I would just show you this. This is a typical deep sky imaging rig that was loaned to me by a club member. So this is a Celestron C9 and a quarter Schmidt Cassegrain. Those of you who know that optical tube, yeah, it's buried underneath all this stuff. But the actual telescope itself is this portion right here, costs around $3,000. So starting from the top, this round cylindrical object here is actually the camera itself. Looks like it's a QHY unit. This is the monochrome version. Since it is the monochrome version, there is the disc-shaped object here. This is the filter wheel, and it's got four or five filters built into it. Astrophotographers, we're so lucky. We get to do everything multiple times. This red disc-shaped object here is an off-axis autoguider. 
little bit tough to hear, see, but this is a cylindrical black thing here. This is a 0.7 focal reducer, speeds things up a little bit. This is an electric focuser operated by a laptop. And this is a do control system. And you've got a lot of these USB connectors of various types going to your computer. And I believe this club member says he uses Nina for his image capture. So the reason I point this out is the telescope costs $3,000, but all that other stuff that I just mentioned, depending on how you buy it and where you buy it, you could easily wind up spending another $4,000 just on that. And once you do that, you still haven't bought the most important component of all, which is the mount. <laughs> Astrophotography begins with the mount. That is the one item that you need to master before moving on to everything else. And a lot of this other stuff that I mentioned also has a learning curve of its own. So to get a proper mount to hold this 32 or 33 pounds worth of equipment here, you're going to be spending another three to $4,000. So your hardware expenditure is going to be close to $10,000. And even then, there's no guarantee you're actually going to get a usable astrophoto. So finally here, we have a real up and comer, unrealistic expectations of what you'll actually see through the eyepiece. You know, I think with the prevalence of 4K TV and video games, it's set up an expectation for some people as to what they'll actually see when they walk up to a telescope and look through the eyepiece. So don't get me wrong here, the moon looks better live than it does through any photograph. And that's hard to explain until you've actually seen it live through a telescope. You will never forget your first views of Saturn and Jupiter through a telescope, and some of the showpiece objects like the double cluster, the Pleiades, the Orion Nebula, you know, those are just gonna knock your socks off. As you move down from that level, things start to get less visually exciting, and it's more about the idea of what you're looking at. And in fact, the overwhelming majority of things you're going to see through a telescope are going to be nothing more than dim, featureless, gray wisps or blobs in the eyepiece. I'm also starting to see a steady stream of messages from people who are outside the hobby and looking to get into it, who assume that every telescope is able to send its images to their phone, their tablet, or to a laptop. And I have to tell them that there have been initial forays into this realm from people like Unistellar and Stellina, but right now those devices are quite expensive at three to $4,000 US, and I don't think those devices are very good. So when I get these letters, again, you have to read between the lines, but when you see stuff like this, not only do they think that, you know, the telescopes already have this feature built into it, a lot of people just assume it's free. Like they're not willing to pay any extra to get this thing. So, you know, this got me thinking, you know, is it possible that we could get there? You know, could this eventually just be built into every telescope? You know, you put a switch in the back on the visual back and in one position, it puts a sensor in the way that sends the image to your phone, to your laptop or to your tablet. You flip the lever the other way and it becomes a conventional telescope that you look through. I don't know, could we get there? It'd be interesting to see, be an interesting trend to watch within this hobby. But until that gets to that point, until we get there, I mean, you know, technology can be fun, but why not just spend some time looking through your telescope? Just even though the object isn't physically exciting to look at, I mean, it's more the idea, think about it. I mean, light has traveled thousands of years, millions of years through the emptiness of space just so that your telescope could capture it and that you could look at it with your eye. And in some way, you have given meaning to the end of that light's journey just by looking at it. Just a beautiful, simple sentiment about the simple joy of looking at things through the night sky and contemplating our place within the universe. Okay, so what did you think? Did any of these get you? Did you have any unrealistic expectations when you first got into the hobby? Let us know in the comments below. I hope this has been of some help to you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.